Way Up with Angela Yee. I'm Angela Yee, and Jasmine from the JasmineBrand.com is here. Yes. <laughs> and President, no, City Council President. Yes. What do I call you, Mary Sheffield? Whatever you want to call me. Angela. What's the What's the official title? City Council President, Mary okay. Sheffield. Okay. Yeah. City Council President, City Mary Council Sheffield President. is here. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being here. And I want to talk to you about just even when I first met you, right? I've always been like, I just really like her. I don't. I, at first, you were um a count. You were a councilwoman. I was a council pro tem. Co- at the what time. is it called? Pro tem. Okay. What is Which that? Which is like the vice president. Okay. Of City Council. Okay, of District 5, yep, yep. which is a district, by the way, where I have my property. Okay, you know, new, the, the upcoming one or the... Boston Edison. Okay. Yep. Yes. Yep. So can you talk about what your role is and what it means to be a council person? So I am the president of the council. Um, I am w- one beneath the mayor. Mm-hmm. So if anything ever happens to the mayor of Detroit, I will be second in line to pretty much take over and run the city of Detroit. Okay. Uh, the city council oversees a $2.5 billion budget. Uh, and we're responsible pretty much for quality of life issues within our city. So responsible for car- uh, garbage pickup, our police response, EMS response, fire. Um, and we approve all city contracts that are above $25,000. So, I mean, we really are, I think, just instrumental in delivering quality service for residents in our city. And we also are policy makers. So right. we create law and legislation that impacts the lives of Detroiters. And for you, just personally, what made you even decide this is the field that I want to get into? Because this is really a field of service. It is. So for my life is a little bit different how I grew up. So I was raised in a servant leadership household. My father is uh, a legendary civil rights activist. In fact, he grew up and was best friends with Reverend L. Sharpton. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so as a young girl, I grew up like marching with Reverend Sharpton and wow. Jesse Jackson and Dick Gregory and Cornel West. And so all these legendary people, I think at a young age, really molded me and shaped me uh, to really understand the importance of service. And so I was really kind of exposed to it at a young age. Mm-hmm. My dad kind of pushed me in that direction. And by the grace of God, I just loved it. I love service. I love public service. I love giving back. And I believe we need more authentic, genuine uh, people in the area of politics as well. I agree with you on that. And you're also the youngest person yep. to ever be elected to the Detroit City Council, which is amazing. But it feels like you've been kind of um, set up in a way that you've had a lot of exposure yep. to what goes on. What makes you not feel sometimes jaded? by politics because I'm sure that can happen too. I mean, when I ran, I had no experience whatsoever in politics. Mm -hmm. In fact, I really didn't even follow politics at all. Um, Again, it was my father who really exposed me to the importance of public service. And so I came in as a fresh face, Mm -hmm. um, as a young, new voice in politics. And people always say we need new, we we need new energy, new innovative ideas. And so I think that is what really kept me just different because I had never been in office before and I was bringing something new. What kind of, uh, Detroit is a unique place. What kind of challenges, unique challenges does Detroit have? So I think Detroit, it is it is unique. Mm-hmm. And I think one of the greatest assets that we have is the people of our city. But I think that when we talk about rebuilding Detroit, we have a high poverty rate. Mm-hmm. And so we still have to overcome the issue of poverty. So many of our residents are below the poverty line. And so trying to raise the income of Detroiters, I think, is really, really important. Um, and then we also still struggle with violence in Detroit. I know at one point in time we were at the top. Yeah. Um, as it relates to violence compared to Chicago and other urban cities mm-hmm. around the country. Right. Uh, we're getting better at it, but we have to address the issue of violence in Detroit and then making sure that more people are coming out of poverty and really raising their income levels as well. Okay. Yeah, what are some things that you can do to address, like you said, the issues of violence? You talk about, um, you know, the poverty level and, and making sure that people have adequate housing. I know is important housing and opportunity. Well, yeah. Yeah. What are some things that you see that have um, that really have directly worked in connection with the crime rate? So we actually just kicked off a program that I'm excited about, which gives money to community grassroots organizations that go out Mm -hmm. and do the work every day. So I love our police department. I think that they play a role as well, too. But I think when we talk about uh, gun violence, you have to give money to and support to these grassroots organizations that really do the the work day in and day out. That it's not just about locking people up, but it's about addressing the mm-hmm. underlying social issues around education, housing, mental health. And so we just launched a program that actually gives grants to nonprofit organizations that are assisting with the police department in high crime areas to really tackle the, the issue of violence. That's a great thing. And then another thing I want to talk about, since while we talk about um, other ways to address some of these issues, is housing in Detroit. I love housing. (laughs) 
I love it. It's my favorite issue. It's my favorite issue, yes. All right, so let's talk about that for a second because, you know, I've invested into some properties, right, in Detroit, but you see so many houses that have been just abandoned, dilapidated. You see the land bank. You see, um, you know, people like, let me invest, but then they're not doing the proper things that they need to do to take care of the properties that they're purchasing, but then they have a program to make sure it can't sit for too long. You have to fix it up. You know, there's all these rules when it comes to blights. And what do you think about people coming and investing in Detroit? Because there's also a balance of wanting to make sure that people that are there, that live there, have the opportunity. And people who are investing are people that you're like, okay, do you care about the city? You know, also. So I think it has to be a balance. Mm -hmm. Like you just said, I think Detroiters want the ability to have generational wealth through owning properties. And what we've seen with the land bank uh, is these investors come in and take large portions of land and then it's not accessible to people who've been in Detroit. So I think we want to rebuild Detroit. We need people to invest. That That's good. But we also want to create opportunities and pathways to home ownership for people who live in a city. And so it's important. In Detroit right now, our real estate, I think, is probably below market through up from a lot of other cities, right? Mm-hmm. I think you can get property in Detroit at a lot lower weight than you can in New York, oh, Chicago, New York. Oh, and anywhere yeah, else. Anywhere. Right. Lower and than so New York. I think we have a it's a great opportunity for people to actually get home and home ownership in Detroit we just have to continue to create opportunities for people to do so and what are some ways that you can do that because I know that is something that is at the top of your list so we we're, we're looking at programs that provide down payment assistance we just actually launched a program where you give $25,000 for first time home buyers mm-hmm. uh, a grant $25,000 to actually purchase their first home this is a brand new program that we just launched for first time home buyers and then we're just trying to create more policies within the land bank that will give access to homes and properties at a discounted rate and allow them time to actually fix and rehab the homes. I'm sure you know that when yeah. you purchase a house with the land bank, that's one thing. <laughs> but then renovating oh, it man. and rehabbing it can cost a lot. And that's another thing that I feel like needs to be worked on, too. It's hard to find contractors, right? Because there's so much work that has to be done and it is expensive. And then we all know when it comes to getting a contractor, it ends up being way more than what they initially uh, quote you as a price. And so I feel like that's another issue too is, and I always feel like there's a great opportunity for people who do that work or want to be involved with that work. You know, there's so much that has to be rebuilt that that is a great field to be in and making sure those opportunities also are going to people who are, um, I love how they do a lot of things with women, you know, with black women and women of color too, and making sure that they're more involved in that whole process, you know, with homes. But how can you find like good contractors? It's one thing to buy a house. It's a whole nother thing to make it. To find contractors. And we right now have a list of about 2000 people who are waiting for home repairs. Mm -hmm. And we don't have contractors to do the work, as you just mentioned. We also have a lot of development taking place in our city. And we're looking for individuals to go into the skilled trades. And so uh, it's a real issue with the amount of construction and Mm -hmm. development happening in the city, trying to get people up and running, creating businesses that tackle the issue of home renovations, et cetera, is important. So we always host fairs. We try to get people connected, how to do business with the city, how to start your nonprofit, your LLC, or your business, because there's so much opportunity in Detroit people just have to be ready to work and really understand the process of how to do business with these, with the city of Detroit we got to get our GC license Jasmine what do you think we'll That's come out. <laughs> oh my goodness can you talk about the, or explain what the inclusionary housing ordinance is so yeah the inclusionary housing ordinance essentially requires that all new development that comes to the city of Detroit and receive some type of incentive or tax abatement that they have to set aside 20 percent of the units for affordable housing okay and so that was my way of making sure that there was inclusion mm-hmm. right in the new development in the new detroit that we're creating right so we're seeing all of these high rises all these beautiful apartment buildings but we want to make sure that if you're getting tax dollars mm-hmm. that a portion of it be set aside for low-income housing and if i live in detroit i'm a detroit native how do i know if i'm eligible for affordable housing so you essentially will have to call or will you apply to that particular building? They mm-hmm. will tell you, hey, we have this amount of units set aside for low income housing. Okay. Here's how you would apply for it. Um, and you really just kind of have to know that this is a part of what the city actually is proposing as well. OK. Yeah. And I want to talk about running for office because I feel like looking at you, you were only, what, 26? Yeah, I was 26 when I first got elected. When yes. you first got elected. Yes. And a lot of times when I talk to younger people and when I go to colleges and speak, right, a lot of what I tell people is I know it can be discouraging. A lot of young people feel like, does it matter? Like, mm-hmm. do politics matter if I vote? Some people feel like things are already said. There's a lot of things that discourage you uh, from voting. And I always tell people, look, you can also run for office. Yes. Right? And so what does it take? 
take to run for office? Because people feel like there's obstacles when it comes to money. They feel like you have to have money to run for office or you have to have some type of connections. Like you said, you had never even really follow politics in that way. So talk about how it was for you, like even just launching your campaign and then, um, you know, <laughs> making it in, into becoming I had a, an elected I official. I had a vision. Um, I knew that this was something that God had placed in my heart to do. You have to have belief in yourself. If you believe in yourself, other people will follow. And I think at the end of the day, I may at the time did not have it all together. I didn't have all the answers. I'm st- I still don't. I th- you know, I th- I'm still learning and growing. But I think people saw my heart and my vision and my compassion for Detroit. Mm-hmm. And I think that that was number one. Um, and so... I worked very hard. I mean, I was day in and day out, knocking doors, talking to people, letting people know my vision for Detroit, and people believed me. Mm -hmm. And so I think ultimately that's what it took. Of course, you have to fundraise, but I think ultimately my thing is that you have to have uh, uh, a true passion for what you do, and you have to have belief in yourself. And when you do that, other people will follow. One thing I noticed is that you do energize a lot of the younger yep, demographic, yep. too. When you go out, everybody's like, oh, yeah, I know Mary Sheffield. Oh, yeah, that's mm-hmm. my girl. Mary, yeah, oh, yeah, she's having a dinner. Oh, she's doing this. Oh, Mary Sheffield's going to come by. And so how important is it to really be in the field, like seeing people, making sure that you're going and supporting different events and being present? It means everything. It means everything. When I first ran, people always say, when people get elected, you never see them. They're not accessible. Mm -hmm. And so that was one thing that I wanted to just bring when I got elected was just to stay real, to stay authentic, to be accessible, to still be out in places and not just, you know, get so high up that you forget where you came from. And so I think that is one way that I believe has always separated me. When I got into office, I always worked with artists and rappers Mm -hmm. and I just brought the culture right to politics as much as I could. And I think that is why um, so many people resonate with who I am and why I lead. And what new responsibilities come of being a city council president? Oh I know you were gosh. elected last year. More haters. No, I'm just <laughs> I was going to say, also, I'm sure that ageism I'm is a playing. thing, too, just being young and being a, the youngest person in that position. Yeah. You know, so yeah. so talk about, like, these new responsibilities and new challenges that you might have. Yeah, I think it's just more, more responsibility from the residents because I'm the president of the council, even though I represent district five people see me as the president of the council so now it's more of a citywide responsibility versus just a district um also as a council president you oversee the administrative uh, uh functions of the city council so there's a lot more office kind of work that i have to do as well too <laughs> believe it or not um but yeah it's just it's more of a citywide reach versus just a city council district now that i'm the council president and, you know, as I'm investing in Detroit, too, you know, I'm, I'm just closing on this uh, building mm-hmm. in Midtown Detroit. Jasmine's also invested in it, too. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm getting cash doll on board, you know, nice. as well. So I'm excited nice. about that. Nice. Um, but one thing when I was doing some research, uh, it was saying that there's a lot of a lot more white people moving into Detroit. Yeah. And the gentrification that's happening right now and, and talking about people actually leaving, you know, Detroit. So. You know, what are some things that because it feels like even being downtown, I remember when downtown, you know, there was nothing there. And now it's like no nothing available. And it's overpriced for a lot of people Mm -hmm. that have been there forever. Mm -hmm. You know, so what are some of the things that you feel like need to happen in the city? Because I know for you, you know, being there and being on the ground and hearing what people have to say firsthand, what are some things that people can do? So I I think in every proposal that comes before me, I'm very intentional to make sure that there's inclusion, that there's an opportunity for Detroiters to Mm -hmm. actually benefit from the redevelopment that we're seeing. A great example was we just were we had a proposal with District Detroit, which is going to be renovating the area around the arena. And I fought extremely hard to make sure that disadvantaged minority businesses have access to that retail space, have access to what's happening in that area to ensure that Detroiters, that black people, Mm -hmm. right, black businesses uh, will be a part of the revitalization. So I just think we have to be intentional as policies and programs come that we're making sure that we're keeping a focus on how Detroiters can benefit and have access to what's happening. And then Dan Gilbert does a lot in he the does. in the city of Detroit. And do you, but it is like 
kind of a monopoly, you know, on things. So what's the balance when it comes to investing and doing so many great things and making it look amazing and drawing more people to come in and work, but then also being like, all right, you know, we want to make sure other people. I think it has to be a balance because we we need, and I've, I've realized this, we need our businesses. We mm-hmm. need the private community and sector to be able to help revitalize our city, but it has to be done in an inclusive way. It has to be done uh, where Detroiters actually benefit and have access to the opportunities. If people are just coming in and investing in Gilbert is just buying up properties but there's no opportunity for Detroit based businesses that's a problem but I will say that I've worked with the Gilbert Foundation they've done an amazing job mm-hmm. at making sure that there are opportunities for Detroit based businesses to actually scale uh, and be a part of the revitalization in our city yeah my girl Jasmine she works with the um not with me. that foundation oh, not, not, oh, not okay. that Jasmine, oh, Jasmine like, okay, DeForest. <laughs> no and I do see a lot of people that are from Detroit yeah. that actually work and you know run a lot of the organizations yeah. so that's a positive yeah. thing Yep. What's yep. your most challenging part of, of your role, your job? Um, the most challenging part, you know, I, I in a in a perfect world would want to be able to please, you know, a, a lot of people, and right. I just feel like I try to do so hard, so to do, to do so well, excuse right. me, mm-hmm. um, and making the best decisions that I can every single day for the people, but. You just can never please everyone. Oh, that's impossible. Yeah. You know, and it's Your just... Your job, you're so crazy trying yeah, to please and, everyone. Yeah, and I'm not trying to please everyone, mm-hmm. but it's just... It, it's, it, sometimes it can be discouraging when yeah. it's like you're out here fighting every day doing the right thing, yeah. and still, it's not enough. What, right. what, initiative, <laughs> never, right. what initiative are you most proud of? Ooh, um, probably inclusionary housing. Okay. Because when you come to Detroit and you see new development, mm-hmm. and then I run into people who say, you know, I was in one of the affordable units. I'm like... Really, I I did that for you. Right. When I see a young, it was a young African African American woman actually at a new apartment building in Detroit, mm-hmm. and said I was in one of the affordable units, and it was because of my ordinance that created that opportunity for her. Uh, so I'm really proud of that. Really, really proud of that. Have you also you've been ordained as a minister too? <laughs> when I was 14, yes. Okay, <laughs> that is so interesting to me. So do you? <laughs> she does everything young. Know, FYI, yeah, yeah, yeah. not anymore. She's the youngest no. one. Right, 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 right. Uh, now. We've also been hearing a lot of rumblings about how you cannot spell mayor without Mary. Hey, I love that phrase. <laughs> and you came up with it, Angela. Okay. So, we got to give you the credit. So what <laughs> what can we look forward to with um, not just President City Council, but also Mayor Mary Sheffield? Is this something that we have our sights set on? I am considering it, for sure. Mm-hmm. And um, I can tell you that there's a lot of support in Detroit for me to take that next step. And I, I just appreciate the love, the encouragement. There's people right now that are just gathering, trying to come together to say, what does it take to get you to that position? And right. so um, when the time is right, I will make an announcement. <laughs> but I can tell you that I'm ready to do something more okay. uh, to challenge myself and to be able to add more value in a different capacity. So we will see what happens. Is there anything your supporters can do now to you know, support you in that p- possible effort? Yeah, I think just, you know, understanding my work, uh, being engaged with local government, um, getting out to vote, registering people to vote. We got to get more people to vote in the city. And I think you can do that. We have to. Yeah. But she wants her supporters to also help do that. Yeah. Right. (laughs) No, but I feel like people feel energized just by the fact that, you know, you're in and to know that there's because a lot of times people vote like I'm choosing the lesser of two evils. Right. And they feel that way. And it is rare that you feel like I'm voting for somebody who I really, really like. Like you're excited to vote for them because I think that. You know, voter turnout also has to do with the candidate as mm-hmm. well, too. Yes. If there's a good candidate that gets you excited, yeah. that gets you up and going, I mean, people will get out and vote. Okay. So. All right. Well, President, Minister, Mayor, Mary <laughs> Sheffield. <laughs> Doctor, <laughs> Honorable. <laughs> Y'all are so sweet. I appreciate you. No, but I've been wanting to have you up here. Now that I have like my own, you know, lituation, I'm on in Detroit also yes, on yes, JLB. I listen which to I'm, you all the time. Which I'm yep. appreciative of, but anything I can ever do like to be supportive. You've always supported me. We're going to do some and... yoga again. And I yep. love things like that. Like in Detroit, you know, we run 313. Shout out to yep. them. They do their running club and I've run with them before. We did our um, our hot yoga. Yep, sure did. <laughs> which was really fun. That was but so nice. I was like, instead of Friday night, instead of going to the club or 
whatever, let's do some hot yoga. And Something. it was all women. Yep. Nice. Somebody fell asleep and started snoring. I don't know who <laughs> I it was. Remember, that was so funny. <laughs> it that, wasn't that me, by the way. That would have been me. It was not me. It wasn't. It but might have been me. No. Right. But I want to thank you as well, Angela, because you put on for the city. You have a genuine love for the city. When I first met you, it was actually on a panel. I'm not sure if you remember. Oh, it was okay. It was on a panel. We were on a panel together. Yeah, no, I do remember that. Yeah, and, yeah. And then we connected afterwards. But I just, I appreciate everything that you do. And I'm excited about this next, this next journey and venture for you as well. So thank you for having me. All right. Well, thank you, President, (laughs) Mayor, Minister, Mary Sheffield. Thank you, Angela. (laughs)